morning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Steve Hovland. I am the Director of Communications here at Home Union. Um, I also lead the research team. I'm proud to present some of our best investment markets for 2017. Our team put together a forecast and worked diligently to provide you guys an opportunity to see where great SFR investments will be this year. Um, there's a couple of housekeeping items. You should be able to see my face. You can hide that if you want to see the full presentation. Uh, at the end, there will be questions. We'll be happy to answer those questions for you. If we do not get to those questions, uh, we will reach out to you and answer them on a one-by-one -on, on -on -one basis. So let's jump right into this without further ado. The agenda today is we're gonna look at the top markets and the SFR outlook. We're going to talk about some of the benefits to investing in SFRs and how you can capture those benefits through the Home Union platform and, buy and uh, purchase SFRs across the country. To start off with this year's economy. We're looking at 2.5% growth over the course of the entire year. When the, 4 Q, when the 4Q 2016 number comes out next week, we expect the 2016 will end up at 2% growth. Um, we think that we'll some of the headwinds that held back growth last year, including low energy prices, uh, uncertainty in China, and Brexit, and Brexit, which a lot of people thought would send England back to the dark ages, those are all gone, and we don't think those are going to be headwinds this year. We think the economy is going to accelerate with a more business-friendly administration in the White House. With 2.5% economic growth, we expect 2.5 million, I'm sorry, 2.5% Economic growth, we expect 2.5 million new jobs. That's better than 2015 or 2016, 2.2 million. Not quite up to the 2014 and 2015 level, which have been the best of this recovery. This will, by no means, be a breakout year that we've seen in a lot uh, that we've been expecting for a long time. We're actually not anticipating any kind of breakout year during this economic recovery cycle. It's going to be long, slow growth before the next recession. So for the SFR market, we looked at the demand side, which is jobs. Housing starts, that's the other big piece of the puzzle to how the SFR market is going to do. We're at approximately 60% of the level that was at the peak of the 04, 05, 06 boom. We're not building that many houses. And the reason for that is developers don't want to build entry-level houses. Land costs are extremely high. We don't have nearly the construction workforce that we hit that we did back then, and they're making much better margins on high-end houses. So the discrepancy between housing costs for new home sales and existing homes is very, very wide. It's tightened up a little bit recently, but it still remains very wide. We don't expect the housing market, to, so the demand is at the bottom of the market, whereas the supply is at the top of the market. We don't expect that gap to close. Because of that, we're going to see a decrease in vacancy this year. SFR vacancy is going to move down 30 basis points from 6.7% to 6.4%. Um, owners are going to have to tap the brakes a little bit on um, rent growth. However, it's still going to be fantastic, well above the inflation rate. It's going to come in about 3.5% nationwide. It's going to vary from market to market, depending on how much supply is coming online in the construction sector. So here's the home ownership rate. At the, in the second quarter of last year, we saw the lowest home ownership rate since the census began tracking that data in 1965. There was a slight uptick in the third quarter. We think that's a temporary uptick. By no means do we think that that's going to hold. In fact, between now and 2030, we expect the home ownership rate to tick down to close to 61%. That's millions of new renter households over the course of that time. So I wanted to show you this slide, tell you a little bit about what's going on in the housing market. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, are we in a bubble? Um, what is this housing market? How is it different than the middle of the last decade? So you can see that there is seasonality here, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But we saw a lot of leverage transactions during the previous housing boom. And that's because people were buying homes with stated income mortgage applications. They didn't really have to qualify. After the housing crash, however, underwriting standards tightened significantly. And cash investors moved into the market, including a lot of institutional buyers. So the percentage of cash sales 
skyrocketed while leverage sales were very low. You didn't have to, you didn't need that much leverage to buy fire sale um, homes that were sold at fire sale prices and sold in bulk from banks that had foreclosed on them. But this low interest rate environment and rising home prices has brought these two lines together over the course of the last seven years. And we expect them to cross in 2017. The reason for that is leverage, uh, interest rates remain very favorable and home prices have gone up where you can amplify your returns by using leverage if, and still be able to capture homes at today's higher prices. So that's what's going on across the country. And we looked at all of these factors to figure out where investors should invest this year. So job growth, which is our demand side of the equation. Construction, we looked at single family and multifamily. The height of the apartment real estate cycle or construction cycle will be in 2017. About 700,000 apartments are coming online across the country this year, which is extremely elevated. And that's going to cause some problems in certain areas. But remember, these apartments are all class A infill properties. So that's going to be an issue in urban areas where you have hyper competition between these new apartment complexes. In suburban areas where they're not building apartments, we're not going to see that kind of um, competition. Uh, we looked at a vacancy. We look at which way is it moving? How low is it going to go? How fast is it going to move? The vacancy factor gives us an idea of what operators can do with rental growth rates. We also looked at investment prices. Just because job growth is good, construction is favorable, vacancy is low, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a great investment market. We're looking at prices. How much is it going to cost the investor to enter that market? And what kind of cap rate are they going to get? Or what kind of return are they going to get in those markets? So our top 10 investment markets, for 2017 are on the screen now. The top three are Atlanta, Orlando, and Seattle. I'll dive a little bit deeper into those. Las Vegas is a great investment market. It's very late to the recovery. The casinos are now making money again and hiring. We also have some Midwest markets, Detroit and Chicago, um, Dallas. Dallas is a great investment market, someplace where we do um, a lot of business as, as a company. Dallas has not been impacted by low energy prices, it's really a financial center in the, in the um, south, in the Sun Belt, and they do a lot of back office jobs, and those jobs create rent or demand. Um, Oakland and San Diego, both supply constrained markets, and they're, in, they're feeling the benefits of spillover demand. So let's talk about Atlanta, though, our top market. 75,000 new jobs are going to be created in Atlanta this year, nearly double the uh, pace of employment growth that we're going to see nationally. Vacancy is going to drop down 120 basis points. So a lot of these new jobs are construction jobs. If you're a football fan and you know the Falcons are going to be in the Super Bowl, they are building two new stadiums, one for the Falcons. So last Sunday's game was the last game at the Georgia Dome. And they're building a new baseball stadium as well for the Atlanta Braves. Equifax is bringing 1,300 jobs to that market as well. And this is just several other major employers. Demand in Atlanta is expected to be very strong which propelled it to the top of our list. Orlando. Orlando is a personal favorite. I love Orlando as an investment market. It's got the right kind of jobs, strong job growth. It had a record number of visitors um, for any U.S. city in 2015. When the 2016 number comes out, we expect it to eclipse the 2015 number. And these visitors, they're coming to Disney World and SeaWorld and Universal Studios. So a lot of tourism jobs. And, what, and it creates a lot of jobs at hotels, restaurants, and all the businesses that cater to tourists. And many of these jobs often preclude home ownership for their employees for a couple reasons. The pay isn't fantastic. And the other thing is, if you've ever worked in the service industry, you'll know that servers don't necessarily claim all of their wages. And because of today's stricter underwriting standards, it's harder to qualify for a mortgage unless you have all of that income showing up on that mortgage application. It's also a $1.5 billion expansion of the Orlando International Airport. That's going to create thousands of jobs during construction, and then after construction, there will be hundreds of jobs um, at Orlando's airport. Seattle. Now, Seattle is a market for a higher-end um, home. So investors with more money to bring to the table can look at Seattle. We're looking at 3.3% employment growth, and it's the it's 
perfect employment growth in terms of tech. Tech, um, Amazon is up there and Microsoft are both in Seattle. And these two uh, tech behemoths, they add a lot of jobs. So it's great employment core jobs that are not going to go away. Amazon just took down a 300,000 square foot lease in South Lake Union. That's going to end up adding hundreds of jobs. And then we work rented 500,000 square feet in Belltown. It's, if you think about how many, um, think about how many jobs that creates, each office worker occupies anywhere from 120 to 150 square feet of office space. So 500,000 square feet is going to be thousands of jobs in that area. Now, now you know where to invest. So why should you be investing in SFRs? And there are several different reasons. I can attest to this myself. I, um, I am a landlord. I do invest in SFRs um, personally. The deductions are fantastic. You can deduct just about every one of your expenses off, off the bottom line. So you get to deduct all these expenses while someone else is paying down a mortgage on a property that you'll eventually own. Depreciation is another fantastic reason to invest in SFRs. You can depreciate the assets over 28 and a half years. But the real reason I want to talk to you about tax benefits is deferring. You can defer capital gains tax. And I know a lot of you came to us and are familiar with the 1031 exchange. I want to touch base on it briefly for those that don't know what it is. 1031 is a section of IRS code that enables you to purchase properties or enables you to trade out investment properties for a like kind of um, property and delay paying capital gains tax. And if you know about compound interest, you know that building wealth without paying taxes and paying taxes at the end is one of the greatest things you can do. So you can grow a portfolio through 1031. You can start out with one or two properties. As equity builds and rents pile up, you can buy more properties or bigger properties or better properties um, by selling the, the original ones and trading up. So you can grow a portfolio, you can grow to a big apartment complex or SFRs all over the country. That's a fantastic benefit. You can also unravel a portfolio. So let me give you an example. I know some of our investors are in California. We know the cap rates for apartment complexes, they hit the bottom in the third quarter of last year. Now they're ticking up again. A lot of that's due to interest rates and prices being so high. And you might be considering, well, you know, cap rates are, they're at the bottom. This is a great time to sell your property. But what should I be buying instead? Where am I going to capture these yields? So if you're close to retirement and you want to unravel a portfolio, what you can do is sell your apartment property, buy SFRs all over the country through a 1031 exchange, not pay capital gains on that, and you've diversified yourself. You're not exposed to any one single market. You can be in Dallas, in Orlando, in Atlanta, and other places throughout the country. And as your retirement goes forward, you can, uh, you can sell these one at a time. You're going to end up paying capital gains on these properties, without a doubt. But you're able to sell each one, one at a time, and be able to liquidate some of that nest egg without selling the entire property all at once and having to pay that huge capital gains bill. So if you want to get started on building this wealth and using 1031s, or if you want to start unraveling and diversifying through 1031s, I'm going to briefly talk about how we can help you as a company. So what we did, we couldn't do this 10 years ago. We didn't have the access to data, and we did not have the computing power, and we didn't have the brilliant data scientists that can go through this and figure out what to do. But we, now we have it. We have 110,000 SFR properties in our database, 200,000 neighborhoods across the country. And we go in and we look at those neighborhoods in specific properties, and figure out which ones make sense to invest in. And we look at price and population and crime, nearby major employers, you know, transportation. We're looking at all these different factors. We also have people on the ground in every market where we operate. Um, so we have local real estate experts on our payroll that validate that information. So we're not just a platform. We actually are in the market as well. And that's important because laws are different across the country. And real estate laws can vary significantly. Taxes for investors compared to homeowners can vary significantly. So if you were to go out and do this by yourself, what you would think might be a great property to invest in can actually end up being 
a nightmare because of something you didn't know or understand or the local real estate agent you picked didn't quite have it together. So based on all this data, we have a neighborhood investment rating. From A plus to C, we only operate A plus to C. This is a risk reward type of thing. If you're familiar with commercial real estate, it's a very similar thing. Properties are rated A to C um, and some B, which would be dilapidated. So A plus, very conservative, lower, re lower return, but lower risk. These are the best neighborhoods in every market. However, you can get an A plus property in Orlando to make a greater return than an A plus property in some place like San Francisco where investment home prices are well over a million dollars. Uh, that works in the apartment sector, it works in the office sector as well. So there is arbitrage across the country. That's how we look at markets and that's how we help our investors make additional money outside of where they're traditionally at. So we've analyzed these markets, we've analyzed these neighborhoods and if you're an investor, you want to, you'll go to our portal and you'll select properties. From, or if you're a real estate agent and you have, and you have clients that want to select properties, they'll do the same thing. You just have to refer them to us. So they'll select, they'll select the properties. We'll acquire those properties on behalf of the investors. So we'll work out a bid range that makes sense for that property where we think that this is a great um, sweet spot to invest. Then we'll stabilize the property. Stabilization takes a couple months. Most of the properties on our platform require some level of rehab, usually five to ten thousand dollars. And what we do is we bring that property up to a standard that is that maximizes the rent. And we have a 66-page document that outlines what we call a home union home. And the home union home is a list of paints that can be used by contractors, carpets that can be used, colors that can be used. And through our experience, we know that this gets the most rent for the investor in that area. So talking about that seasonality we saw on that slide in the past, you can see that prices and rents are both seasonal. So by investing right now in the winter time, when the traditional home buyers are not very active in the market, you can maximize, um, you can get the most property for your buck. Properties are discounted right now. And through a stabilization period, it's between escrow and rehab takes a couple months. And if you've ever invested in a cold weather climate like in Cleveland, you'll know that it's really challenging to find renters in the winter, much easier to find them during the prime renting season, which begins in March and runs through August. So by buying now, you're buying at the lowest price and you're going to get the most rent because that property will be ready to rent right as we enter the prime renting season. We also manage the property end to end. For you or your clients, you don't have to, we don't, um, there are no 2 a.m. phone calls, there's no you know, leaky pipes, we take care of all of that. And we track the performance of those properties. Every investor with us, um, they get a monthly statement on how that property is performing, along with the rent distribution. And at the end of the, um, at, when you want to sell your property, we'll sell it on our platform for a discount to another investor. I know a lot of real estate agents are on this call. I just want to briefly talk to you about how you can refer people, especially if you're here in California or other high priced markets where it's challenging to find investment properties. You might have clients that want to find investment properties. What you do is you refer them to Home Union and we'll send you away um, a link for you to refer your clients to us. And that way you can just have them click on that link, register with us and you're out. Um, you don't have to do any more. We'll go through the whole process with them, and we'll give you one third of the buy side commission just by referring people to us. And that's for every property they buy now and into the future. So if they start with two and they end up with 10, we will keep distributing that commission to your clients over time. And you don't have to do anything other than introduce us to them. Whether you're an investor or a real estate professional, and you refer an investor to us, everyone's going to come to our asset recommendation engine. What this does is it pairs up an investor's goals and desires, timelines, how much they want to invest, what they want to make, their risk tolerance, with a set of properties across the country that will help them um, meet their investment goals. 
So this is what a portfolio builder looks like. And I'm going to briefly go into one portfolio for you. And you can think of it as adding, um, you can do it in multiple. So this is a three property portfolio. These are all properties that are or have been on our platform recently. And you know, the investment amount here is 150,000. You can get three properties for a portfolio of almost a half a million. These properties provide a $3,900 a month rent dividend. They also take care of themselves. So once you purchase these properties, there shouldn't be any, unless something catastrophic goes wrong, there's risk with every investment. There shouldn't be any capital flowing in. These properties should be taking care of themselves. The renter will pay down the mortgage on this. You can realize a 16% total return on this portfolio. Maybe you have 300,000 you want to invest. You know, just think of it as six properties. So this is an example of properties that we have on our platform that you as an investor can buy. Now, that concludes this portion of it. We have some questions that have come in. I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, and again, if we don't get to your question, we'll reach out and we'll answer that question um, separately. But the first question is 1031. There's been some talk about going, that 1031 is going to go away. This is true. Um, as recently as 2015, both the House and the Senate had 1031 on the chopping block, and they were going to get rid of that tax benefit in favor of corporate taxes. So I know the real estate lobbying groups have worked very hard to prevent that from happening. Um, we are working very hard to prevent that from happening, but it could end up going away. And now that there is alignment between the House and the White House, um, it's a real possibility that that could come back as, a, as an issue for um, investors down the road. Um, the next question is about interest rates. So the Fed raised interest rates in December for the second time this real estate cycle. It's been a very, very slow interest rate um, increasing environment. They do plan on raising interest rates three times this year. Last year, they planned on raising interest rates three times as well. They only got one. We think they're going to hold to it this year. We think the inflation is going to be there for them to raise interest rates. The equity markets hit an all-time high yesterday. And the protectionism that we're seeing coming out of the new administration tends to increase inflation as consumer goods are built here in the United States. So, yeah, I think that interest rates will go up three ticks this year, 75 basis points. Um, that will probably be a one to one on mortgage interest rates as that goes up. So the quicker you take advantage of today's low rate, the better off you're going to be with a lower cost of capital. So I don't want to keep you too much longer. I want to thank you for joining us today, real estate professionals. If you have any questions, email us at realloyalty@homeuni.com. If you're an investor, info at homeuni.com. We will reach out and answer the rest of your questions. Again, I appreciate your time. Have a great